Welcome everyone. My name is Haley Buckner and I'm the Professional Relations Manager with Elevate Oral Care. Thank you for joining us this evening. Before we start, let me cover a few housekeeping notes. For those of you remaining online past 50 minutes, your CE certificate will be emailed automatically within hours of the completion of this talk. Be sure to check your spam folder. You are muted, so don't worry about background noise. We will have time at the end for questions and you can submit your questions on your webinar dashboard. Our managing member, Steve Pardue, will be tracking questions throughout the talk. Over the past two years, we have held a series of free live CE webinars on topics aimed at preparing offices for the necessary changes to patient care. Each of these webinars were recorded and are available with free self-instruction CE at the web address that you can see on the screen, elevateoralcare.com slash elevatingcare. Be sure to bookmark this page and return often to see what's new in free CE. We are putting together the remainder of our 2021 and our 2022 free live CE calendar. So feel free to suggest topics at info at elevateoralcare.com. We are honored tonight to host Dr. Norman Tinanoff, a recognized expert on oral health prevention, to present to us his lecture titled Fluoride's Role in Post-Pandemic Dentistry, Mechanism and Efficacy. Offices have many prevention therapies available to help patients take control of their risk for caries. This lecture will help clinicians sort through which tools might be best for individualized patient care. And now a little bit about our speaker, Dr. Norman Tinanoff. He received his dental degree from the University of Maryland in 1971 after receiving his certificate and master's degree in pediatric dentistry at the University of Iowa. He spent another year at the VA hospital in Iowa City in a research fellowship. Dr. Tinanoff's two-year military service was at the Army Institute of Dental Research at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. For 23 years, he was at the U University of Connecticut Health Center, where he was the director of the Pediatric Dentistry Graduate Program for 16 of those years. From 1999 to 2016, he was chairman of the Department of Pediatric Dentistry and the Department of Health Promotion and Policy at the University of Maryland. Dr. Tinanoff has authored or co-authored over 250 publications, primarily on fluoride mechanisms, antimicrobials, caries risk factors, early childhood caries and prevention. His current interests are concerned with preventing dental caries, oral health access for underserved child populations, and developing clinical policies and guidelines. Dr. Tinanoff has no disclosures to report. So Dr. Tinanoff, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a great honor for me to be part of the Elevating Care CE program. The topic fluoride in the post-pandemic era is timely since we all have learned to reduce our aerosols by using temporary restorations, hulk rounds, and optimizing fluoride. As you can see, I changed the title a little bit to include um, more emphasis on clinical applications. And so we're going to spend some time on clinical applications as well as the mechanisms and efficacy of fluoride. So I'm um, at the end of the program, I'm going to be happy to share um, my slides with anybody who wants them. I'll send them out as a PDF, and so my email address will be associated at the end of the program. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, I, I would like this program to be through the lens of public health and how we can optimize fluoride in that re with that regard. So, with in the public health arena, the um, People usually discuss prevention as either primary prevention, secondary prevention, or tertiary prevention. So for primary prevention, we're talking about preventing new lesions. Secondary prevention is controlling initial lesions prior to cavitation. Tertiary prevention is non-invasive caries arrest. So we're gonna use that lens to discuss um, the mechanisms of fluoride. But first, let's talk about the objectives. At the end, I want you to be able to understand the differences between systemic and topical fluoride. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Know the mechanisms of action of fluoride in primary and secondary and tertiary prevention, as we just talked about. Know the mechanisms of action of fluoride compounds other than sodium fluoride. It's one of my favorite topics. Be familiar with the concentration of fluoride in professional topical fluoride treatments and home fluoride products. 
and to be able to design fluoride programs for children at different ages with low and high caries risk. So I'm going to break this presentation up into three main areas, mechanisms of fluoride, fluoride efficacy, and then look at clinical applications. So with regard to mechanisms, I'm going to touch base on um, looking at fluoride from a systemic view or a topical view, what, what is most important. I'm going to talk about the fluoride ion as part of the mechanisms, and fluoride ion is going to be concerned with primary and secondary prevention. And then talk about fluoride medical metal compounds, um, stannous, specifically stannous fluoride and silver diamond fluoride as tertiary prevention. So let's go and start with looking at mechanisms of fluoride. So there's always confusion about whether fluoride is systemic or topical. So I'd like to work our way around um, this idea with a five-year-old child. This is a five-year-old child with erupted teeth and developing teeth and show you how fluoride, even though it's it, you get a topical effect and it's swallowed and it goes through the, through the body, how we how we consider the fluoride is either topical or or systemic. So let's take a, a look at this five-year-old child who swallows a fluoride tablet. So he swallows a fluoride tablet. It goes into first goes into his GI tract, and you can see these large arrows. The big arrows are the major pathways. So in the GI tract, if it's bound, if that fluoride is bound with calcium, aluminum, or other metals, it is not metabolized. It doesn't go throughout the system. And it just goes out the fecal route. But the, most of it goes out the, in the plasma, into the plasma, and we get elevated plasma fluoride levels. And then it goes to the right, it either goes out, oops, it goes out the, um, um, to the bone or, or the urinary um, area. I, I, but that's a really not that much concern to us. But the major arrow is going to the bone because there is a lot more bone than there is teeth. But when the plasma fluoride levels are increased because the fluoride's going out the GI tract to, to the plasma, we have elevated plasma fluoride levels. And you get a secondary topical effect um, from elevated salivary fluoride levels and elevated gingival curricular fluoride levels. So now besides the first topical effect where the child is chewing up the fluoride tablet, swishing around, swallowing, then you get a secondary topical effect by elevated salivary fluoride levels and, and elevated gingival curricular fluid levels. Now, this elevated plasma fluoride level also will affect developing teeth. So two things happen with developing teeth. As a tooth is developing, fluoride can get it will be incorporated into the entire tooth structure, and then you have elevated fluoride throughout the tooth structure. But the larger effect is when that tooth is already fully formed, and it's prior to eruption, it's, it's fully formed and may not erupt for a year or so, then the fluoride from the from the plasma fluoride levels will bind to the outer surface of the enamel, increasing the fluoride levels on the surface of the enamel. Let's take a look at that now a little bit. So, so, this is, so let's talk about systemic versus topical. First, as we talked about, fluoride is incorporated through the uninterrupted tooth during development. And that is really a pure systemic effect of fluoride being incorporated throughout the, the erupting tooth, excuse me, the developing tooth. Then, but the fully developing uninterrupted tooth is bathed in fluoride for months or even years before its eruption. So the fluoride there is topically affecting the outer surface of the enamel. And fluoride release into salivary and curricular fluids also affects the, also is a topical effect for the erupted teeth. So in Maine, in general, fluoride uh, is a, even if it's swallowed, it's, the effect is primarily topical. It's only a small effect, and it, when it, that could be called systemic, when is the fluoride is incorporated through the uninterrupted tooth. So here is a section of an erupted tooth, and this is a, a investigator Weatherall who um, spent many, many hours taking little sections of tooth, 
and you can see the outer surface of the tooth uh, to the inner surface of this tooth. He, he took samples and measured the fluoride levels in that. And you can see the outer five to 10 microns of the tooth structure are high in fluoride. And then it goes greatly goes down after about 10 microns. And it has a low, much lower level and slightly increases as it gets to the pulpal, to, 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 excuse me, to the dentin wall. This is called a hockey stick appearance of fluoride. So that's a little bit about uh, systemic versus topical. Let me get into the issue of the fluoride mechanism now. And we're going to talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary effects of fluoride. So the primary effect of fluoride, uh, a primary effect is fluoride's effect on bacterial metabolism. I think you all remember from your high school, college biochemistry that this is a, this is a bacterial cell and glucose goes into the cell, converts to, to, gluco, to glucose 6-phosphate, goes to 2-phosphate glycerate, phosphate and pyruvate, pyruvate, then finally pyruvate, then goes out to lactic acid. So bacteria eat sugar, produce acid, the acid is on the tooth for a long enough time and a, high, and, and a lower pH concentration, you can get, uh, get tooth demineralization. But let's look how fluoride has its primary effect um, on bacterial metabolism. First of all, this process involves an enzyme enolase. And, and as I think you probably remember from, from chemistry or even from dental school, that enolase contains is a magnesium containing enzyme and fluoride binds with enolase when fluoride binds with enolase it shuts the enzyme down and so the glucose pathway gets shut down not completely but to a large degree at 2-phosphoglycerate and then you get less lactic acid the other thing that's important here is that enol that this conversion from 2-phosphoglycerate to phosphoenopyruvate is an energy 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 releasing step and that energy is used to pump glucose into the cell. So less glucose pumped into the cell, less glucose 6-phosphate, and less, less lactic acid because the, the conversion from 2-phosphoglycerate to phosphoenopyruvate is, is shut down. Now, this is an experiment that I did when I was a sophomore in college, which I, I wasn't even thinking about dentistry at the time. But this was an experiment that um, our teacher was having us do to show the mechanisms of, of um, anaerobic metabolism with bacteria. And so we just we did that experiment, uh, just like I just showed you, that with the addition of fluoride, if, this is after fluoride, it had built up a 2-phosphoglycerate, less phosphoenopyruvate, and then would be less acid. And as you remember, the conversion from 2-phosphoglycerate to phosphoenopyruvate reduces energy, less energy um, form in the presence of fluoride, less glucose 6-phosphate. So this is an important effect on how fluoride affects bacterial metabolism, and it, there's less acid produced in the presence of fluoride, even at very small levels, 5 to 10 parts per million. So so that's um, what we call primary prevention, is preventing demineralization of teeth before it even occurs. And that is probably mainly due to its effect on bacterial metabolism. Secondary prevention is what we can consider remineralization. So, so this is a tooth, cut tooth surface, and this is phase contrast microscopy of the tooth and a white spot lesion. And you can see the tooth is in blue here, and, the, and of course, it's phase contrast microscopy. The white spot lesion, in this case, with an intact surface, is dark. The fluoride acts as a catalyst for remineralization. It takes the calcium and phosphate in the saliva and acts as a catalyst to remineralize the surface. And we all know that this occurs, and this is secondary prevention. It's preventing a lesion that's already started. But this, in this case, the lesion has not broken down, so it's still secondary prevention. And you can see that the surface is really more dense, bluer, because of fluoride is getting incorporated into the surface of the enamel. So this, the surface 
of a remineralized tooth is actually harder than it was originally. So secondary prevention, remineralization. So we've all seen this where we have teeth that erupted and you have demineralization, but that those waste spot lesions arrest with time. And when they arrest, they originally they were could be rough. And then with time, remineralization, they become smooth again. So remineralization, in this case, primary maxillary and anterior teeth. So fluoride ion mechanisms. Um, I know we all, when we were in dental school and, and before, we were taught, at least I was taught, that the primary mechanism was fluoride reduced the solubility of hydroxyapatite because fluoride combined with hydroxyapatite to, fluor, to form fluorapatite. That does occur. It especially occurs in vitro and especially occurs with um, powder enamel. But um, clinical researchers and those interested in, in um, fluoride mechanisms don't find that that occurs at a very high level. So it's a minor mechanism, and that's why it's, it's, um, it's, um, it, it's unhighlighted because I want to really emphasize the fact that fluoride's main mechanism, the primary um, um, primary um, prevention is effect on bacterial cell metabolism. Secondary prevention is remineralization. Tertiary prevention is, is when you have a cavity that's already formed and, uh, and then fluoride work, can work on that lesion and that's tertiary prevention. And it's especially true with fluoride metal compounds. And let's go into this a little bit here because this is important. Okay, so we, we all know that metals are toxic. I, I remember when I was a little kid, my mother would put mercurochrome on my, on my sores because that would that had contained mercury. I mean, that was crazy to do that. I wouldn't do it anymore, but that was antimicrobial. So other heavy metals, copper, gold, silver, mercury, tin are strongly metal toxic. And so the other, so other metals, zinc, lead, nickel, iron are less toxic. But when these, these metals are combined with fluoride, we see bacterial toxicity um, to, to these products as well as other properties. So let's take a deep dive into this fluoride metal, fluoride metal compounds. It's not so simple because when you add these metal fluoride compounds um, to, to, into an aqueous environment, uh, we have stannous fluoride, here's stannous fluoride, it gets broken down to stannic fluoride, stannic hydroxide, and other compounds. And the only active one is the, the stannous fluoride with a SN plus two. So with these, so there's specific moieties that are active and that is the reason why it's taken so long for some of these things to um, become commercial products because we have to keep these, these, the tin, in this case, tin at the active tin plus plus um, balance. So let's just talk, take a look at antimicrobial effects of metals and we'll go into specifics of stannous fluoride and silver diamine fluoride. So metals, disrupt bacterial enzyme function, disrupt bacterial cell walls, disrupt transport systems, and so they have antibacterial properties. And that's opposed to fluoride itself, which reduces, reduces the metabolism of bacteria, but this has strong antibacterial properties. So toxicity of the bacteria may also be related to substantivity. Tin, silver, stick around in the oral cavity for a long time, especially stick around when there's a, when there's a cavitation. So the substantivity allows these, these the tin or, or silver to, to stay in the, in the cavities for long periods of time, exerting their antimicrobial effect. People have known that metals have had antimicrobial activity for many, many years. F 1500 years BC, the Egyptians were using it to 
um, uh, pr preserved mummies. So metals are commonly used now as antimicrobials in modern medicine. They reduce biofilms. They reduce the smell in clothing. I think you've seen those advertisements where they talk about copper in clothing, reduces the smell in clothing. Of course, it's an antimicrobial effect. And they gain, they're also gaining more importance due to antibiotic resistance. So metals are antimicrobial, and we want to talk about those combined with fluoride. So my interest for many years has been the antimicrobial mechanisms of tin as stannous fluoride. So here's a very simple experiment to show that. Here is um, an orthodontic wire in a growth media, and both these wires have been inoculated with mutant streptococci, the bacteria that causes dental caries. And every 12 hours, the wires were taken out and treated for one minute with either stannous fluoride at 250 parts per million, pH 3.8, for sodium fluoride, 250 parts per million, pH 3.8. You can see the bacteria on the wire hardly grows when these wires are treated with stannous fluoride as compared to sodium fluoride. So there's a strong antimicrobial effect that demonstrated by this very simple experiment. This is an electron micrograph of bacteria on enamel. Here's enamel, these are bacteria. And these dark areas are tin that's getting into the cells, affecting the cell walls, and causing antimicrobial, um, anti-plaque, and also anti-gingivitis effects because it's killing the, killing the bacteria. So I've spent maybe 15, 20 years looking at the antimicrobial mechanisms of tin. That's why I want to show you what some of the things that I know about it. So this was done, this was a study done in 1985. This is the first study that looked at the those antimicrobial effects of stannous fluoride and how it affects plaque and how it affects gingivitis. So this is a two-year trial, and you see baseline, clear, um, one year and two year of individuals that rinsed daily with either APF rinse or stannous fluoride rinse, and you can see that there is a difference in gingivitis over, over the years. They initially started out close to being uh, similar, but you can see this was about a 30% reduction at one year and at, at two years. So this is the first study that showed that stannous fluoride had strong anti-gingivitis effects as well as antibacterial effects. So this study has been repeated many times now. And here is um, a meta-analysis of one, two, three, four, five studies that have looked at stannous fluoride versus sodium fluoride toothpaste in this case six months trial. So all these trials were done for six months. And we can see that there is a consistency of all these trials that show it favors stannous fluoride um, with regard to gingivitis compared to sodium fluoride toothpaste. Okay. And this is, a, and over a six month period, this study, you combine all the, the results of the study, shows about a 10% reduction in gingivitis with, the, with um, stannous fluoride toothpaste compared to sodium fluoride toothpaste. So there are now, since those products have been, since stannous fluoride has been figured, it's been figured out how to stabilize stannous fluoride in an aqueous solution, we have toothpaste that have come out with stannous fluoride. And you can see that there are many on the market. Here, just here's some examples. I have no stock in any of these products. Here's Crest Pro Health, contains 1,000 parts per million fluoride as stannous fluoride. Colgate SF means stannous fluoride. This contains the same amount of, of stannous fluoride. Sensodyne gum and sensitivity, the gum one, contains stannous fluoride. Periodontics, you've seen this advertised many times, probably in TV. It says helps prevent, pre prevent bleeding gums, also containing 1,000 parts per million fluoride as stannous fluoride. So this is now a popular product, and it it's probably makes sense to use a stannous fluoride toothpaste because not only are you having the fluoride ion effect, but you're having the metal effect, reducing, gin, reducing gingivitis and reducing plaque. So that's stannous fluoride in toothpaste. So there's another product, silver diamine fluoride. Okay, this contains silver and fluoride. And this has been approved by the FDA 
2014 to treat sensitivity in patients over the age of 21. Most of us have used this and we use it off-label because we, we know of its great effect in arresting caries. So here is an example of a patient that I saw and I only got a chance to treat her one time with silver diamine fluoride. And you can see here that we were looking at this lesion right here. We treated all of, all of these lesions with, with, uh, with status fluoride. Seven months later, you can see the lesion almost disappear because the, the metal is getting inside the lesion and the metal is electron dense and it's, and it's, and it's, it's giving you a false impression that the lesion is actually healed. But the, the, this lesion is arrested. And three years later, the silver is still in this tooth. It has great substantivity. And this, this cavity has been arrested for three years. It hasn't grown at all over a three-year period. So you can see caries arrest from, from initially here and, and over seven months and over three years where the where the silver is still in the tooth and we have long, great substantivity. So fluoride medical, medical, metal compounds, just in summary. So the heavy metals, tin, zinc, copper, silver, and lead, mercury, all have antimicrobial properties. I wouldn't use mercury for these properties anymore, but I, I have done experiments with copper fluoride and that has similar antimicrobial properties. So fluoride metal compounds reduce plaque and gingivitis may improve micro hardness and they do and that's it, arresting caries lesions because the metal tin interacts with um, with the enamel and caries dentin hardening the, the, the dentin and as it, as it was first advertised that it also reduces hypersensitivity dentinal hypersensitivity So that is um, a brief summary of fluoride mechanisms. Now I'd like to go into efficacy of the fluoride, fluoride products. So let's look at the efficacy of water fluoridation, fluoride toothpaste, varnish, gels, silver diamine fluoride, 5% gel paste, these are the concentrated toothpaste at 5,000 parts per million, 0.2% sodium fluoride, that's a fluoride mouth rinse that's used once a day in school systems, and profi paste. So let's just look at the evidence that we have with regard to the efficacy of fluoride in these various different forms. So this is a study done in Australia, 2018, and it's showing about a 50% reduction in, in um, with regard to fluoride from the those individuals living in a non-fluoridated area comparing those who living in a upland fluoridated area. And so the permanent dent teeth, about the same effect. Now, this, this is another, um, I'm having a, one second, I have a problem with a cat. I have to lock up a cat. Hold on. Okay, I'm sorry about that interruption, but the cat was going to start playing with my computer and my, my screen, so I had to lock him up, and you, you probably could, could hear him. So this is a systematic review of various studies of water fluoridation, and, you can, and this is the reduction in decay missing filled surfaces. And you can see all these are positive, showing a difference of the effect of fluoridated water um, in five-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 12-year-olds, etc. So universally, when fluoride has been, water fluoridation has been explored, we get large reductions in, in caries. Now, that Australian study was looking at about a 50% reduction in caries. Most U.S. studies now, 
recently are about 25 to 30% reduction in caries just due to fluoridated water. So some people don't have fluoridated water and so there's recommendations to use fluoride supplements and here's a fluoride supplement uh, regimen. Um, so for people that live in, children living in non-fluoridated area, children between ages six months to three years, a quarter milligram of fluoride per day, from three to six years of age, a half a milligram a day, from six to 16, one milligram a day. If they live in a fluoridated community, no, no supplements necessary. And the efficacy here is about the same as fluoridated water, um, but there are issues with fluoride supplements and they're not that popular for the following reasons. One, you really need to test water supplies for fluoride um, to make sure that people are, don't have fluoridated, aren't drinking fluoridated water. And the FDA, let's go back one slide. FDA, excuse me, the CDC in 2001 said this should only be used for children at caries risk. So often fluoride supplements are, are used um, um, without checking for caries risk, especially with regard to physicians not checking for caries risk. And you have to weigh the risk and benefits of fluoride supplements. There is a small increased risk with fluoride supplements compared to fluoridated water, because when you take a fluoride supplement, you get a steep rise in plasma fluoride levels right away, and so this gives it more of a risk for, um, for fluorosis. And there's confusion that exists with regard to how to prescribe supplements for time spent away from home. Kids may be living in non-fluoridated community, but go to a school where the water is fluoridated. Okay, and so what I mentioned just before, fluorosis may be elevated with fluoride supplements due to spikes in plasma fluoride levels compared to when you're using just fluoridated water. And I've noticed this all the time, there's poor compliance with administration um, especially with parents from high-risk kids are less likely to comply. So I'll give you examples. I've seen this many times when I have prescribed fluoride supplements and I've given a parent six-month supply. And then when I come, I see them in six months, I ask them how they're doing with the fluoride supplements. They say, oh, they don't need a re-prescription because they still have plenty left. That means they haven't been using them. So there are issues with fluoride supplements. Okay, so this is the efficacy of fluoride toothpaste. And this, these top two studies were done with low fluoride toothpaste, 500 parts per, per million, and these bottom studies were done with 1,000 parts per million fluoride. You can see all these studies show favoring fluoride toothpaste. And it's favoring fluoride, favoring fluoride toothpaste with re regard to, to caries, and it's preventing caries by about 30%. You can see about 30% with, with with 1,000 parts per million fluoride. So fluoride is really, a fluoride toothpaste, using it twice a day, is really a key to our preventive programs. 30% reduction of, of caries just using brushing teeth twice a day with fluoride toothpaste. And we all know that it has to be used with caution with um, kids under age six because they, they swallow most of, the, uh, most of the toothpaste. And so for kids under age three, we all know that we're supposed to use a smear fluoridated toothpaste. From ages three to six, pea-sized amount of fluoride toothpaste. After age six, it really doesn't matter how much is on the brush because if there's gonna be any fluorosis, it, will, it won't affect the, the teeth that, that, that one would see. It, doesn't, it won't affect the anterior teeth. It would probably only affect the, the second molars and third molars at that, at that point. So a smear for children under age three, pea size three to six. Okay, now this is, uh, let me um, digress for a minute. This is one of my pet peeves. Um, and so let me just run through this shortly. Um, and this is the FDA toothpaste warning that you'll see on every tube of toothpaste. It says, warning, keep, keep out of reach, it should be out, out of reach of children under age six years of age, if more than used for brushing is accidentally swallowed, get medical help or contact the poison control center. So this has caused the poison control centers to be flooded with regard to anxious parents, with regard to their child who swallowed all the fluoride on the brush or, or, or started licking the fluoride on, from the, the tube of toothpaste. 
no child has ever died from swallowing a whole tube of toothpaste. They may, they may throw up on the toothpaste, but they, nobody has ever died from it. So this warning scares people. Get medical help or contact the Poison Control Center right away. That is really a scary recommendation. And it stops people from using fluoride toothpaste, um, especially for young children. And so the other direction on the tube of toothpaste is children under age two years of age consult a dentist or physician. We really need to get children's teeth brushed as those teeth erupt, and especially starting at age one. So this other direction here is for me is problematic. As you can see, I really have my um, antenna up with regard to these instructions that we see on these toothbrush. Um, tubes. Okay, keep out, keep out of reach of children. Contact the poison control center right away. Under age two, ask a dentist or a physician if, for their advice. Okay, both those things are troubling to me. Okay, so the benefits of these warning is that there is a theoretical reduction in toxicity, lethal, lethal dose. Okay, and as I mentioned, no child has ever has ever been reported that a child has ever died due to swallowing even a full tube of toothpaste. The harms of this warning is it affects fluoride toothpaste use. And as we know, brushing with fluoride toothpaste reduces caries by 30%, the number one thing that parents can do to reduce caries. So there's unnecessary concerns to poison control center and, um, and um, so the benefits to this warning um, is none and the harms are are a lot and encourages parents, and we, we see this, you probably see this in your practices, to go out and find what they call training toothpaste, um, those that don't contain any fluoride. And it also has an issue with Head Start, Head Start programs requiring a dentist or, or physician to do a prescription to allow children to get their teeth brushed if they're under two years of age. And it contradicts the ADA's Publish systematic reviews and guidelines for, for fluoride toothpaste efficacy and safety. So here we have training toothpaste, fluoride free. And this is this is the problem that I see all the time. You probably see it also in your practices. Parents are afraid of fluoride toothpaste, in part due to the, the labels that, that we see on, on the toothpaste tubes. So that that's my little deviation here from talking about um, um, efficacy, but I just have to express my strong feelings about um, CDEC's guidelines. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is fluoride varnish efficacy. Okay, originally we saw fluoride varnish that was dispensed in a Depen dish. Now it's a much better approach where it's in a single-use container and uh, we know exactly how much is being used. In this case, this container, this this container is um, single-use container contains 0.25 mLs, and that would be exactly 5.6 milligrams of fluoride. And so, we all know how it's applied. Let's look at the efficacy of this 2.26 fluoride varnish in primary teeth, and we can look at these studies. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven studies that we can look at, and from the studies we see they all, almost all favor the experimental, which is fluoride varnish, a couple of them are on the line. But in general, the, the sum of the data is um, favoring fluoride varnish and fluoride varnish in primary teeth, in primary teeth is a 17% reduction in, in caries. Permanent teeth, more studies, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine studies, and it shows a 40% reduction in caries in permanent teeth. So here we're adding tooth brushing, which is 30% you know, on the, um, adult teeth, we're getting additional 40% reduction in caries um, with regard to um, using uh, fluoride varnish. This is probably not used very much anymore. Um, this is fluoride in trays. Um, you know, this probably fell away 10 years ago, 
where we put fluoride, 1.23% fluoride in trays, have patients um, uh, hold it in their mouth for uh, four minutes. So a small tray for children, larger tray, um, and it's five mLs in a small tray, 10 mLs in a larger tray, hold it in the mouth for, for, for four minutes. Let's look at the, and here is fluoride foam that became popular because of um, um, it, it, it recommended only uh, using it only for a minute, except if you look at the fine print here, it said can be used for four minutes also. So when I was using fluoride foam, um, I was using it for four minutes. The density is one tenth that of gels, uh, the, but the fluoride directly um, is a, can be associated with the teeth. But because the density is less, there's less fluoride that, that could be swallowed, so it's probably safer. Let's look at some of the data with regard to APF gels and permanent teeth. And you can see there are many, many studies, six-month applications, 12-month applications, 24-month applications. And you can see, if you look at the total here of all these, this diamond here shows that it favors the fluoride gel and about a 25% reduction of these fluoride gel treatments in trays. Um, but this is this now is probably history because most people are not using you know, fluoride gels in trays, probably because patients are uncomfortable using it and and the necessary of using a saliva ejector and holding it in the mouth, holding the tray in the mouth for, for four minutes. Okay, so this is um, the the efficacy of silver diamond fluoride and. Here we see um, we see some studies. There are more studies now, but there are some studies. I'll show you the more recent studies, and you can see that six-month follow-up we see large reductions in uh, favoring silver silver diamond fluoride, and this the diamond points to an 80% reduction. But you can see that the studies are quite variable. Uh, this one, the six-month studies, um, some showed efficacy, some didn't. And, but they're all a little bit all over the place. And so they're, they're, it's called high heterogeneity, that they're, that they're not consistent. And so some of these studies are also, um, um, could have risk of bias because of when the studies were done. It's obvious to the examiner, kids who have, have had um, silver diamond fluoride because their teeth are, uh, may have discolorations. So, but from this 24-month data, carestasians were arrested in treatment groups was 72%. Um, but the other interesting thing that we ne need to recognize is that there's some natural arrests that occur just because of perhaps a fluoridated toothpaste or other effects changing the diets, and there's some natural arrests that occur. And so that is also added into the study. So we have a better study to show you. Well, first of all, before that, you can see the side effects that you all know about with silver, silver diamine fluoride. You, you get the stains. This is probably more severe than most times we see it. Uh, and then also, if you touch the gingiva, you can get it, um, tattoos less for about a week. So there is a side effect. And you have to this needs to be recognized. And you have to ask the parent. Um, whether they are willing to to have discolored teeth for arrested lesions. So because of all this data and the high heterogeneity and lack of blinding in the studies, the ADA in 2017, excuse me, the AAPD, American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry in 2017, said um, it supported the use of silver diamine fluoride, 38% silver diamine fluoride, but they had a conditional recommendation due to the quality of evidence, blinding issue of blinding of studies, and the high heterogeneity. But there is a recent study that really negates some of these issues because this study used um, looked at two had two groups: one group that was annual, and a group that was silver diamond fluoride was done annually, and a group that was done semi-annually. Both groups had stain on their teeth, and so the blinding issue uh, was not was not a problem in the study. And you can see at the 
all surfaces over after 30 months, you can see um, the the annual treatment had a 66% reduction in in caries and the um, the semi-annual 75% reduction. So more reduction semi-annual. But the other interesting thing here is they looked at anterior teeth, upper anterior teeth, posterior teeth, etc. And we can see a difference in the effect um, with regard to anterior teeth where we see an 85% reduction in caries on anterior teeth, but in posterior teeth, a lesser reduction, 50%. Um, lower posterior teeth, 62%. So silver diamine fluoride is effective um, with, with arresting caries. And here's a, a study that doesn't have a risk of bias, and but the effect is probably greater on anterior teeth than it is on posterior teeth. But in general, we see it in both, but greater 85% on anterior teeth versus 57% and 62% in posterior teeth when it's done semi-annually. Okay, so let's look at the efficacy of 0.5% fluoride paste or gel. This is commercially known as Prevident, and there are, this is a different way of displaying this data. This, I got this from the ADA publication 2014. And this is look at the bottom line here is 5% fluoride gel professionally were supervised at school, permanent teeth, and six randomized control trials. And with that, so 0.5% fluoride gel, that's five times more the strength of fluoridated toothpaste, 35.6% reduction from six trials. And so here's another good product to use, and I use it very frequently for high-risk children over age six and for kids who are getting orthodontic appliances in place. And I have them brush twice a day with this 0.5% fluoride paste or fluoride gel. So the, here's one of the studies that we have with regard to fluoride mouth rinses. And so this, these studies are many, many studies. They favor fluoride mouth rinses, but all these studies were done many, many years ago, and those studies were not conducted with the rigor that current studies are done. So we're, we're a little skeptical about these studies done in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so most of us are a little skeptical about um, the efficacy and whether this 23% from fluoride mouth rinses is a true number. Um, so. There's a question here with regard to fluoride mouth rinses. It does show efficacy, 23%, um, but studies were done many years ago. This is this is efficacy of 1.23% propupase. Okay, this is an easy one. There's no efficacy. There are some, just a few randomized controlled trials, and they show no effect. Okay, here, no effect, no effect. Okay, no effect in decayed adult teeth, no effect in primary teeth. So, I wouldn't use be using profi paste that contains fluoride as a way to provide a fluoride treatment. Okay, these these profi paste with contain fluoride probably don't have much efficacy with regard to reducing caries. So let's talk about clinical applications and look at fluoride delivery systems, optimizing the, the delivery systems, fluoride protocols, and go through a couple of cases. So, so these are this is the this is the professional strength fluoride, pray or brush on. This is the prevalent type of fluoride or gel cam. These are both tray or brush on. Um, then here we have our weekly rinses, 0.2 called it's commercially available as called 0.2 percent. Daily rinses, 0.05 percent. Toothpaste, a thousand parts per million. So because these are listed as compounds, sodium fluoride, stannous fluoride, stannous fluoride, or parts per, per million, it gets very confusing. So to compare apples to apples, I like to look at these things in, as the amount of fluoride ion. So the APF gel that was used in trays contains 1.23% fluoride. Now let's look at fluoride varnish. It's 2.26% fluoride. 
iron, silver diamine fluoride, 5% fluoride, Prevident, 0.5% fluoride, comparing that to toothpaste, 0.1%. So toothpaste contains 1,000 parts per million, 0.1% fluoride, and that compare that to Prevident, five times the strength, compare that to silver diamine fluoride, 10 times the strength of Prevident, and you can see um, sodium fluoride varnish, um, half the strength of silver diamine fluoride, but when we look at these things, we also need to take into account how much is being applied. So with silver diamond fluoride, you're just placing a small drop on the on the cavitated lesions. Silver diamond, excuse me, sodium fluoride varnish, you're using small quantities, maybe 5.6 milligrams of fluoride in the from the prepackaged container, compared to toothpaste, where you're using um, a smear or or a, a pea size amount for young children. So for um, for Prevident, which is five times the amount of fluoride, um, can be used for children over age six, where issues of fluoride is not is not problem problem. When at the end of this presentation, I will uh, I will give you my email address so you can have copies of of these slides as well as this. The summary of fluoride compounds if you'd like to see it again. So let's look at the efficacy of these fluoride de delivery systems and um, and just try to summarize it. So optimally fluoridated water, US studies 25%. We saw that Australian study 50%. Fluoridated toothpaste, a lot of studies there, 25%. We have systematic reviews on that, so we have good data there. Fluoride varnish, 17% for primary teeth, 40% for permanent teeth. Fluoride gel trace, 25%. Silver diamond fluoride, 80% for caries of risk. Some studies didn't have good controls because of the staining, but that's a good number, 80%. Fluoride gels paste is the 0.5%. The Prevident type of products, 35%, permanent teeth only. The 0.2% sodium fluoride rinse, that's one that's used once a week in school systems, 16 to 55%. Again, these are old studies, high risk of bias. The 0.05% over-the-counter sodium fluoride rinse, um, 23%. These are old studies. Um, be careful with the, that number. And fluoride profi paste, no, no percent. So let's see how we can optimize these fluoride de delivery systems. As we know, we've gone from one part per million in, in optimally fluoridated water to 0.7 parts per million because this is this is the um, great point for caries reduction, but it minimizes fluorosis. So it's been maybe seven, eight years ago now, it was reduced from one part per million to 0.7 parts per million. Fluoride toothpaste, optimize it by twice a day using 1,000 parts per million fluoride. Children, as we've talked about before, smear or pea size. Bit, don't rinse. It, there's much better efficacy if you don't rinse. So we recommend spitting out the toothpaste, don't rinse. You get a longer effect if you don't rinse. Fluoride varnish, high risk children every three months, moderate risk children every six months. Silver diamond fluoride, best efficacy is every six months on cavitated lesions. That 0.5% gel paste, Prevent type of material at least daily over age six. As a uh, for children that have high caries risk or potentially have high caries risk, like if they're going to get um, orthodontic appliances. The 0.2% sodium fluoride rinse weekly in school systems, non fluoridated communities. The studies have been done many years ago. This is a just a summary of optimize how we can optimize our fluoride delivery systems. Now, when we optimize these fluoride systems, we also have to take into caries a risk as we move into um, specifics on individual patients. So the ADA has a caries risk assessment, ADA, 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 ADA has a caries risk assessment uh, regimen, the American Academy of Pediatrics has one, but we all can 
easily recognize those kids are at high risk versus those kids at low risk. But these are just some of the things that we look at. Um, mother or caregiver has high caries. Um, children has frequent exposure to between the meal stacks. Child has cavity, has white has white spot lesions or or incipient lesions or visible caries. Those all make a child high caries risk. So when we then determine a risk for an individual patient, we're we're trying to optimize it for each for individual patient. We're looking at low caries risk individuals, and that primarily is low risk individuals is twice daily brushing with fluoride toothpaste. This is really important. We want everybody to do it twice daily brushing with fluoride toothpaste at, at all the ages, as opposed to high caries risk. So this zero to two year old, twice daily brushing with fluoride toothpaste. So this is contradicting the CDC where they say, don't start until age two, but I real, as soon as teeth erupt, I think we, and the AEA agrees with that, that we should be brushing children's teeth. Fluoride supplements, if they live in a non fluoridated area, professional topical fluoride treatment every three months, silver diamond fluoride on open lesions, and six-year-old, where we can start brushing with high-potency fluoride gel, fluoride supplements, again, if they live in a non fluoridated area, professional topical fluoride every three months. So this is how we individualize it for patients depending on their carrier's risk. So let's use a couple examples, wind up with a couple um, scenarios here. So this is a Sammy, a two-year-old. He lives in a non-fluoridated community. For his CARES risk assessment, he is considered at low CARES risk. So here is his odontogram, no caries. And the fluoride component for his treatment plan would be have, brush his teeth twice a day with a smear of a thousand parts per million fluoride. And that's about all that may be necessary for Sammy at low care, two-year-old at low CARES risk. Here's Sally, Sally at age five. She lives in an optimally Florida community. However, however, she's at high caries risk from our clinical and radiographic findings. Here you can see the dinogram where she has caries lesions on our occlusal surfaces of her molars and proximal surfaces of her molar, anterior teeth. So Sally is a different story from, from Sammy. So a fluoride component of her treatment plan is brush her teeth twice daily, in this case with a pea-sized amount of 1,000 parts per million fluoride. Consider silver diamine fluoride to arrest maxa anterior caries and maybe posterior caries. Topical fluoride varnish um, every three months. So here we have a high risk individual and we need to throw everything at her. This is Sean, age 12. He has restored caries lesions on his first primary molars and soon to have full mouth orthodontic appliances. So here we're talking about brushing twice daily with fluoride toothpaste, but at the prescription strength level, the 0.5% toothpaste. And topical fluoride varnish is going to be high risk every three months. So, so let's just summarize this a little bit with fluoride in the post-pandemic era. We were talking about primary prevention, and that is altering bacterial metabolism, secondary prevention, remineralizing undetected or white spot lesions, tertiary prevention, these are when you already have cavitated lesions. In those cases, metal fluoride compounds are bactericidal. They increase the micro hardness of carious dentin, and the metals remain in lesions and substantivity. So, in the public health perspective, we're looking at fluoride in all three perspectives of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So, it's now um, one hour, and so let me see if we have any questions and here also is my email address if you want to write to me i'll be happy to share my slides with you so let's open up to questions if if we have any all right thank you dr tenenoff for an excellent presentation uh, we do have some questions that have come in through the presentation so i'll go ahead and ask a few of those now uh, i'll start off with the most important one what's your cat's name my my cat's name <laughs> <laughs> my cat's name is tico <laughs> very good. The presentation also, but I kicked them out. Very good. Um, but there's another question on that topic. Um, is there a benefit to using topical fluorides on dogs and cats? Well, my, my daughter is a veterinarian, and she would say uh, no. <laughs> because <laughs> dogs and cats rarely get cavities unless you feed them sugary foods. And you shouldn't be feeding them sugary foods. 
but my daughter also says that you should brush your leash your dog's teeth um uh, i had a dog i never did that and she has a dog she doesn't do it but that, that's her recommendation but so fluoride not for dogs and cats okay very good um another question to back up to stannis fluoride products there are brush on toothpastes there are brush on gels and there are rinse concentrate forms of stannis fluoride uh, is there a way you would recommend one versus the other or a certain time you'd use one versus yeah. the other? Right. I have a strong recommendation for, for the toothpaste because people brush their teeth. It's not hard to convince them to brush their teeth twice a day. Most people are brushing their teeth twice a day. And um, it's, this contains um, a thousand parts per million fluoride at, the, at a good concentration of, of, um, of tin. And so just switch your toothpaste to one that contains stannous fluoride and then you will have greater effect especially with regard to uh, for plaque scores and gingivitis scores why not so I, I i recommend and i brush my teeth twice a day with stannous fluoride containing toothpaste i'm not going to tell you which, which brand <laughs> very good um another known fact of stannous fluoride is that it does stain the tooth surface um, it does. can you just can you describe that stain and yeah. do these new toothpaste yeah, that as opposed to silver fluoride, the stain is light yellow in generally, but if people aren't brushing their teeth very well and there's plaque accumulation, it can get to the brown stage. But there are some products now, some toothpaste products that contain whitening agents with, these, with the stannous fluoride. So these products have a whitening agent and that whitening agent um, is, does wonders in keeping the teeth um, in reducing that stain or neutralizing the stain. Okay, very good. Um, changing topic a little bit to silver diamine fluoride. Uh, you showed a case where you treated a patient with silver diamine fluoride once. Um, yeah, and then. Oh. Yeah, I couldn't get the patient back. I couldn't get the patient uh, back. That was the rest I got the patient back in seven months, then I couldn't get the patient back until it was three, uh, three months later. Excuse me, three years later. Okay. But so. it's still, I mean, that that still demonstrates the effectiveness of silver diamine fluoride in this child. Okay. And, yeah, okay. so and the, the stain, recommendation is six months. Yeah, the stain remains, after three years, it remains in there, showing that silver is still in that lesion. Okay. Uh, on silver diamine fluoride, uh, there was a question. The preventive effect that you showed was different between the anterior and posterior versus maxillary yeah. and mandibular. Is there a reason for that? Uh, I think people, when they're trying to do it on the posterior teeth, um, they're, they're trying to um, put it interproximally. That's that's okay, um, and I, I would do that. Um, but it's it's actually much um, easier to do that application and probably more efficacious in the front of the mouth. Um, the other thing is when you have caries in the posterior proximal uh, surfaces. That, that's the ones that you usually we're talking about is you still have food traps in those teeth and and that really hurts the the uh, arrestment process and so if you would be able to keep those teeth interproximally clean get get the food out get the plaque out uh, interproximally it may have, have in, a similar efficacy as the front teeth but i i think those food traps and plaque traps interproximally are or a factor why it doesn't work as well posteriorly. Okay, very good. Um, and just another shift, you mentioned 5,000 parts per million fluoride toothpaste or 0.5% per, yeah. sodium fluoride gels and pastes. Yeah. What, but those are for ages six and up. What would you do for a high-risk patient under the age of six? Under the age of six, um, I'm, I'm concentrating on, well, first of all, if they have Teeth that I can use, um, cavitated lesions that they, they're interested in um, remineralizing, I use silver diamine fluoride. But I'm having them brush their teeth twice a day with fluoridated toothpaste at the right amount, pea size or smear. And I'm giving them fluoride varnish treatments every three months. I'm, having, I'm recalling them every three months. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, another question in a different direction as well. Uh, what would you say to parents that are concerned about fluoride or neurotoxicity of fluoride? Uh, okay, so let me, I was prepared for that slide a little bit. Let me, 
Um, let me uh, just mention anti-fluoridationists for a second. That's the topic of anti-fluoridationists. So uh, that's why I prepared these two slides in case it came up. So th there's an issue of anti-fluoridationists like anti-vaccination. Anti um, there's a common good versus individual rights. I certainly understand that. And there's opposition groups, libertarians, religious reasons, anti-vaxxers, Green Party, talk radio, and I understand that as well. And so those people are generally uh, anti-fluoridation and they probably don't want their children brushing their teeth with fluoride or they don't have their children drink the fluoridated water. Um, and so in the past, we've heard that fluoride is a toxic insect poison, communist conspiracy, socialized medicine, contributes to allergies, Alzheimer's, autism, arthritis, cancer, gout syndrome, brittle bone, kidney disease, thyroid disease, and the latest is low IQ. And so there are a couple of studies out of Canada, which they, let me show you the results here. So this is a, a study um, showing kids that lived in a uh, non-fluoridated area versus a kid that lived in the fluoridated area. And the amount of fluoride they're ingesting is about right for those two areas. So let's look at the scattered plot of those that are in the non-fluoridated, they're black, versus the fluoridated area, and look at, this is IQ. And these researchers made a point about, there's a difference here. And for my God's honest, honest truth, I cannot see a difference. Um, and so, uh, and there have been other people that have, have question their their studies, their results, their methods. So this is the most popular thing right now is, is um, low IQ, but these other ones have been around, Alzheimer's, autism, arthritis, cancer, Down syndrome, and they, mm -hmm. they, they have not shown to be true. And the latest one now is low IQ. And from what I have seen from that data, I can't make heads or tails out of it. Out of seeing a difference between IQ and fluoridated versus non fluoridated communities. Okay, appreciate the answer. Thank you. Uh, another question is fluoride filtered out through regular portable water filters? Um, and the question continues should infants use or should parents use wa fluoridated water to mix infant formula? Yeah, the two good questions. Um, first one is water filters. Um, most water filters do not. Um, take out fluoride. There's two that do, reverse osmosis and um, distillation. They're the only two that will take out fluoride. The other ones don't. And so um, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, the other issue is flora, using fluoridated water um, with regard to uh, diluting, um, reconstituting um, infant formula. One of the reasons why the FDA reduced the, the CDC reduced the, the amount of fluoride in, in optimally fluoride water from, from 1 to 0.7 was because of the issue of, of a one-year-old child. This is the worst case scenario. One-year-old child who's having his, his, his um, infant formula um, diluted with optimally fluoridated water. At that one-year-old age, they're probably drinking a liter of that water, a liter of that infant formula a day. So that's the greatest amount. So if you look at that um, that scenario of using one part per million fluoride, drinking a liter of that fluoridated water, that would be a little bit above the level that the CDC is comfortable with for systemic swallowing. At 0.7, it's almost dead open at 0.05 milligrams per kilogram. So I, there's no, really no concern anymore with regard to, in my mind, um, um, d diluting um, or reconstituting infant formula with optimally fluoridated water. But it gives you almost exactly the right amount of fluoride per day, 0.05 milligrams per kilogram. Good okay. question. Thank you very much for the answers there. And we are Coming up at 10 past the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and close it out. And thank you again for your presentation and hand this over to Haley to um, say thank a few housekeeping items.
All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Tuninoff and Tico for a great presentation. And thank you all for joining. To our guests, your CE certificate will be emailed automatically within an hour or two. And make sure to check your spam folder. Also, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for links to new free CE events. And then also, don't forget the link that we shared earlier, the elevateoralcare.com slash elevatingcare. That gives you access to our archived webinars, including our panel discussion, or excuse me, including our discussion today, um, which should occur before the end of the week. Please share this link with your staff and colleagues. And finally, on our Elevate Oral Care website, you will find buttons to request an informative CE eligible staff meeting for your office. For your office um, education on the latest evidence in oral health prevention is what we do and we're thrilled to be back doing what we do best safely helping you serve your patients so thank you all again and have a wonderful and safe rest of the week